Devin and Morgana have been celebrating midlife love by getting married a hundred times in a hundred countries. They believe grown-up love gets better and more fun, especially for women. Everyone's smarter, wiser, men are more relationship ready, and if they're not, it's obvious. Forget anything you were told about being too old or too late for love and adventure. Instead, get fresh new tips on dating, relating, and travel to exotic destinations. And best of all, call in for personal guidance, creating crazy, sexy midlife love in your life. Hello, hello, and welcome to Crazy Sexy Midlife Love. I'm Morgana. This is my husband, Devin. And I'm impressed. I will say my wife cut the introduction for that, and I have to say she did a pretty good job. And why should we care what you think about that? No one should. Because yeah. happy What's your wife, background? happy life. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no. Because I, I, I was in post-production editorial for years with Miramax, Mer- with Miramax and, and even worked with the, uh, you know, the, the Weinstein brothers. At, well, you know, it, <laughs> we could tell some stories to be sure. Uh, but no, so nice job. I thought that was, you know. That was good. Well, your first feedback was rather scathing. A scathing is such a powerful word. No, I think it probably, I probably said something to the effect of it could be improved <laughs> dramatically. <laughs> is that, was that wrong? That was, Should no. I use sort of more of a delicate sensibility? No, I took your notes. Oh, good. Yeah. 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 So anyway, well done. I thought that was kind of a pretty cool promo oh, that we got you. going I'm on. I'm glad. I'm glad. And I have to stop moving my arm, which is shaking the table, which yeah. I do so, weekly, it seems. So my illustrious husband, you've been like a relationship coach and a spiritual teacher for a couple decades now. Yeah, it seems to go by. And a travel blogger for like maybe 15 years or so. Yeah, more. Long time. Yeah, really long time. Also, um, besides being an excellent West Coast Swing dance partner and a film editor and a blogger, you are an author. So scary, by the way, very scary being married to an author. So this is Devin's best-selling book for your holiday shopping, 10,000 Miles with My Dead Father's Ashes, went to number one all over the place after travel Spain and Portugal addiction, it's family a stuff. Whole, a whole variety of sort of like Amazon thing. And it really answers the question of what do you do when you lose your father's ashes <laughs> For on real. the way to his final, his final request in right. this world. So yes. anyway, it's a complicated book. And uh, yeah, that. Well, For all of your gift giving. I brought that up because Devin's writing a new book. And I'm in this book. Like this is this is all long before we met. Thank right. God, because if I had met him at that time, I would have rightfully run in the other direction. There, there was a point. I will just very. Br- I know that you're heading in a different direction, yeah. but just very briefly, I remember, like literally carrying the 300 page sort of like first draft and a half thing to Morgana, and we weren't living together at the time. But it was like 300 pages that I printed out, and it was like here. And I had so many sort of like, oh man, this is a lot of personal unvarnished information about me to this woman that, you know, I'm in love with. And there was a point where I saw her shortly afterwards and she was traumatized. (laughs) It was not, it was just one of those things like, oh, right. Okay. So she's on chapter four. Like I knew like, oh, okay, this is. This is not, I am not putting myself in a good light. I am really, really, really grateful that you refused all of my earlier requests to let me read it until I was like good and hooked. Yeah, you had to be deep. You had to be, you and I had to be like deep in love. We had to be in the the entrenchment. Because you were kind of terrifying in this book. Oh, uh, well, you know. Well, it, from a romantic standpoint. Yeah, as a, as a potential partner, this was not, this is not a selling point. You know, this is a, a little much. But so but that- it gives, you, But it will give unrealistic hope out there to women that they're 
that people change. Problem. I'm going to go with that. <laughs> yes. I'm going to go with people change yeah. and, and all that kind of good yeah. stuff. Yeah, but I would really strongly recommend that you wait until the person has changed. Don't date the potential. Wait until after the fact when he's a great person because it's a crapshoot. And, you know, you have to love what you have. Like you can't love what you hope he will be. All you can do is love what you have in front of you that's love loving potential is not love it's a negotiation yeah. well which is not and that brings me to jazz hands yeah my so Devin is writing his new book about love and he's got this writer's group that meets every Sunday and every now and then I get hungry right around the time that he's reading his portion I believe it's on purpose I, I don't not, believe it's, it's happenstance I never know and then I've like any reasonably uh, curious person, I listen in to hear what he says about me. Is that why you walk around with that glass in your hand? <laughs> to press against a door? I thought I was being subtle. Yeah, no, that's a uh, thing. Devin described me as a former actress and ballerina who is now, how did you put it? Uh, you're just jazz hands yeah waiting for a next performance yeah i'm just like i've been distilled as a human being as like a pair of jazz hands but in in fairness yeah it was in the context of my own sort of like i should wear gray and walk against a wall and that fade is into much the more yeah. yeah how do i fade into the background how do i lean behind you so you can when I'm tugging you, going, look, Devin, look, the camera's there. Come on, over right. there. Yeah, no, I'm I'm heading in the opposite direction. Yeah. So this within itself is is a little painful. That's but um, I'm glad it's been a uh, wonderful sport. Oh yeah. Well, and by the way, to change the subject, yes, a perennial favorite, right? We have to bring this All up right. as well. That's my every topic. year. This is my international best-selling book number one in all categories, USA, Canada, uh, Great Britain, and Germany of all places. And then number two in France and Italy. And it just like every year people buy around this year, Financial Alchemy, 12 Months of Magic and Manifestation. It's a combination of book and self-coaching system. And- That's uh, my copy. Right. I get one every year. Yes. And, but we are completing last year's copy. So uh, there is an exercise that Devin and I do every year that I've excerpted from this book, which by the way, plug is available on Amazon, of course. But there is an exercise at the end that I call my new year manifestation formula, which I am making available to everybody. The link should be on the show page. Uh, so I'm not gonna, it's too long to speak That's out. That's a nice thing. Yeah, this is, this has been such a dumpster fire of a year, even with wonderful things. It's a dumpster fire of a really traumatic year that we're gonna feel for a long time. So it's, I'm not gonna give my usual pitch of like, end the year on a high note. End the year extracting all of the blessings and gems and learnings and breakthroughs that you can, because we are gonna take whatever this year gave us and we're gonna make a really, really powerful, good, different year in 2021. And that's what this is about. It's about finding the highlights, finding the accomplishments, finding the learnings, what did you do well, and building a foundation for what you're gonna create in the coming year and how to design it strategically to make it as easy as possible because I think struggle is grotesquely overrated. So this is my new year magic, new year manifesting formula. You can get it for $40 on Amazon and the book too and the free two hour Q and A recording that you get as a surprise when you go to my website and enter your receipt. And then there's also a totally separate recording that you get inside the book, the link inside the book. Or you can start by just for free getting the New Year, manifesting, <laughs> New Year Manifesting Formula that we're gonna have 
on this show's episode page at bbsradio.com forward slash crazy sexy midlife love. And now moving into the new year as powerfully as we can, despite all of the horrible things that happened this year and why stop there? All of the things that have happened in your life. We're gonna actually, I brought in a beloved friend and expert on fearless living. Oh, this is a good one. You're gonna like this. Oh my God. I have known Rhonda Britton way back when dinosaurs roamed the earth and she and I were actresses in the very early, early days of coaching. Rhonda was one of the first ones. I think this was before Fearless Living. I remember Rhonda in our talent manager's office. You were coming up with all these amazing breakthrough exercises. Even then you assigned me a word. I don't even remember the context, but I do remember that the word you gave me was satisfied. You might figure out what the exercise was that went with that. But okay, so Rhonda, is a huge pioneer in the personal development world. She won, I don't even know how many Emmy Awards for the first ever life coaching TV show starting over. She has written a bunch of best-selling books, most famous for Fearless Living. And wouldn't you know, there's a book called Fearless Loving, which is perfect for this show. And she is the founder of the Fearless Living Institute training other coaches in her modality. So, and I love her because she's just a really cool, marvelous lady. So Rhonda, come on in. Yay, I'm so excited to be here. Hello, hello, hello. hello. So excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, And I loved your end of the year exercise for manifestation you know, starting to do those accomplishments and all the lessons and learnings. I mean, this year has been rich, right? It's been rich. So I love that. And I say, yes, yes, yes. And we've known each other. Yeah, we knew each other when we were actresses. Oh my God, so long ago. And I remember you came to one of my workshops as, as like, like, I'll go see what Ron is doing. I'll go check it out, you know, supporter. And I so appreciated that. So thank you. Oh, my pleasure. It's just of our like, click of coaches in LA. You're the one I've known the longest. So, um, and for all the time that we've known each other, I've never asked you this. And I'm genuinely curious, what got you into coaching? What from the acting to the coaching? That's a really great question. So, um, you know, I have wanted, I wanted to be an actor since I was a little girl, right? And I grew up in a little tiny town in Michigan and there was no actresses, there was no theater, there was nothing. So I didn't do it because of course, I don't know how to, I don't know anybody that does it. Moved to Minneapolis, went to school, had a roommate that was an actress in LA. So I make my escape with her as she moves back to LA and I am like committed now, right? And, you know, I do it every day and I'm devoted and I do it. And then as I started getting more successful, started working more, I actually liked acting less. And I realized that what I liked is the acting classes, not actually working as an actress. Mm. And I think the classes of acting, really, I actually think every junior high student, everybody from the ages of 10 to 15, 16, needs to take acting classes and improv in order to heal their emotional life. Like I got so many emotions. I got in touch with my emotions. I got really connected to myself. And so I started thinking about like, am I supposed to, I I don't know what. And so I made the bold decision to leave acting, which was actually quite devastating. I I went through a big identity crisis. I, it's like, I went through a midlife crisis because, you know, in my, when I was 28 or 32 years old, thinking like, oh my God, who am I gonna be if I'm not an actress? Cause I've wanted it for so long. And then um, during that time of healing from giving up acting, I was in a lot of classes. I've always been a self-help junkie, personal development junkie, spiritual junkie, et cetera. And um, I was working when I was owned my own little PR agency. And one of my clients was literally one of the first life coaches ever in the whole world, right? And he would always tell me, you're going to be a better coach than me. And I went, "Mm, no, I don't think you understand Uh, my life. You know what happened in my life? Are you crazy? I could never be a coach. So he would just say to me all the time, oh, you're going to be a better life coach than me. You're going to be a better life coach than me. And I was like, 
And this is, this is how God works is I booked him. You remember the learning addicts from years ago, right? I booked him as a speaker at a learning annex. And as we entered the room and he started literally two minutes in, he ran out of the room. He had gotten food poisoning and was horribly sick. And there I am with a room full of people and I teach for the next three hours. And that was the beginning. And there, then I also had some spiritual experiences that basically said, must do it. Um, I had a, a awakening experience. And that was the first thing that when, when, when I had to teach and I went, oh, it was like, the, it was like acting, but being myself, right? Because I always wanted to be myself, but I was afraid to be. So it was, it was really empowering. So that began the twist, I should say, the turn towards becoming a coach. Thank you. That's, yeah. I think all the original coaches that I know, um, and we had one of them a couple of weeks ago, uh, but Thomas Leonard and Michael Stratford and uh, a bunch of others whose names I can't even remember, a lot started out as actors. And I think that there's a huge overlap in acting skills, like the empathy, the respect for another viewpoint, the collaboration, the problem solving, I think the healing, except you don't have to lie about your age and <laughs> <laughs> like all, well, the, know, I, all the nonsense I, that came with acting. Yeah. Well, I always make a joke. Like, you know, when I was an actress, all I did was pray for a series, like, please, God, give me my son series, God, please, God, give me my own series, right, please. And I would get really close. I would have, I would, I, I think I filmed like three to three or four series. And I would remember that um, I knew one woman who it was her fifth series that she became, you know, the show became a big hit, right? So I was like, I'm so close, I'm so close. And then when I gave up acting, of course, I was never going to have my own series. I was never going to be on TV. And so the joke of the century, I always say, God knows what he's doing. He knew that I needed skills to be on TV because then when the first show, actually the first show ever in the world for uh, coaching was in, it was in London. And I was in London on my book tour and they were like, would you audition for the show that was starting for the first life coach show in the world? And I said, sure. So I went in and, you know, of course, I knocked it out of the park because I wasn't afraid of the camera. I knew how to, you know, like I, I knew how to do it. Right. And so three weeks later, I was living in London doing the very first show hosted by a life coach, i.e. me, in the world. And so then when Starting Over came in America, I was the only person in the world that had ever done it, right, ever done it. So, of course, they hired me. And but the joke of the century, I remember living in London doing the show going, well, it wasn't the show I thought I would be in. But here I am in a TV show, for, I've done 600 episodes of TV as myself, which is the thing I wanted to be the most. It was like, God really does know what he's doing or she's doing, <laughs> depending. So you're human jazz hands too. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I just love being alive, right? We want to be alive. We want to be happy to be alive and yes. Yeah. Um, fearless living you have a story I so do. i will assume that we have fans of yours listening and we also have some people who don't know you so before we like dive into really scary things like dating <laughs> what is your story well thank you and i appreciate I appreciate you asking because um you know, it's one of the reasons when my mentor, i.e. my client who became my mentor in coaching would say to me, you're going to be a better coach than me. And I'd be like, you don't know what's happened to me. My life is too screwed up. I could never tell anybody else what to do. Right. And who knew that the very thing that was the death of me in my, in my, most of my life for 20 years would become my resurrection. Right. Isn't that always, always how it was at isn't how it, it always always happens. So what you're referring to is the worst day of my life. I was 14 years old. And as I told you, I grew up in a little tiny town in Upper Michigan. And it was Father's Day. My parents had recently separated and my father was coming to take us out to brunch, Sunday brunch on Father's Day. And I don't know how you guys grew up, but 
we didn't go out to eat. There's three kids, two adults, too much money. Like we didn't do this. So there was a big special day. My mother made me a brand new dress, you know, getting all pretty, getting all puffed up. And my two sisters are fighting it out in our one bathroom. Me and my mom are just putting on a blue eyeshadow and I'm watching. And my dad knocks on the door, goes, come on, come on. Cause that's what dads do. And then me and my mom and dad start walking out. My sister's still in the bathroom fighting it out. And, uh, as my father and I walk out with my mother, he says he has to get his coat from the car. Now this coat was a tan Nada Hyde leisure suit coat. So you knew my father was a good looking man. And so as he opens the trunk to get his coat, I notice out of the corner of my eye that he does not grab a coat. In fact, he grabs a gun and he starts screaming at my mother, you made me do this, you made me do this. And I, I yell back, dad, what are you doing? Dad, what are you doing? Stop. And he had already shot my mother once. He cocks the gun, points it at me. I'm absolutely believe, I absolutely believe I'm next. Uh, my father looks at me, blinks. I look at him, blink. And literally it's like, the, you know, the, when the world stops, like the world stopped, like we just were looking at each other and I was just waiting for the bullet to go off and for me to be dead like my mother or I assume my mother was. And as that bullet, as that gun is in my face, my mother screams out literally with her last breath, no, don't. And my, mother, my father realizing my mother's still alive, takes that bullet intended for me and shoots my mother a second time. And that second bullet goes through my mother's abdomen, out her back, lands in the car horn. And for the next 20 minutes, all I heard was Aah. And then my father cocks the gun, jumps to his knees, puts the gun to his head and fires. So in a matter of Two minutes, I was the sole witness of watching my father murder my mother and commit suicide in front of me. Now, I, I don't know how other people would respond, but this is how I responded. I basically split into two that day, you know, the outside of me and the inside of me, right? The external, and I was fine, I was fine, I was fine. I remember people coming over that day and I'd be like, oh no, I forgive him. No, I mean, I was fine. I even went skating that night because I did every Sunday night. So I went skating, right? I mean, can you imagine? I mean, just thinking about that, just like, what? And um, because I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, right? Um, but I wasn't fine. I was anything but fine. Because when you're the sole witness to your mother being murdered and you don't save her, because I did nothing heroic. I didn't jump in front of the gun. I didn't grab the gun. I didn't kick my father in the shins. I did nothing heroic. And now she's dead. And I'm the only one that could have saved her. You don't ever get to be happy again. Like that's just off the table, right? So for the next 20 years, I basically on the outside pretended I was fine, but on the inside, uh, basically started drinking to manage to, to, to stuff my emotions. Uh, got three DUIs, became an alcoholic, uh, three suicide attempts. And it was my third suicide attempt that I realized that I'm not very good at killing myself. And I better figure this out because I wasn't dying, but I wasn't healing. I wasn't changing. So that third suicide attempt, and again, I'll, I'll preface this, those 20 years that I was drinking suicide attempts, DUIs, I was going to therapy, reading books, going to workshops. I, was, I am a straight A student and I was a straight A student trying to heal myself. But no matter what I did, it, no matter what therapy I went to, what workshop I went to, what shaman experience I went to, energy healing, inner child work, you name it, it was good. I got skills and I got tools and it was lovely, but it didn't take the fundamental feeling away that there was something wrong with me. It didn't take that fundal, fundamental feeling away from me. And when I had that third suicide attempt and I woke up to begrudgingly, I didn't want to be awake. And uh, they put me in a psychiatric ward for evaluation. They deemed me not crazy. They sent me home. And I remember realizing uh, I gotta, I, I'm not dying. So I gotta figure out how to live because I can't keep living like this. And that Morgana and Devin is actually when I created the very first exercise that ended up becoming fearless living. But of course I wasn't thinking of that. I was just trying to save my own life. But I started that day, I, I remember it so distinctly. I had my back to the wall and I slid down the wall, you know, that classic slide down the wall and going, what am I, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? And I remember thinking, you have to start at the beginning. So I actually went to the store, got some 
calendar with some gold stars and started putting a gold star on the calendar every single day that I did anything good, like anything good. Cause you have to remember, even though externally maybe people thought I was good, you know, I was a straight A student. I was a good worker, you know, went to call all those things, uh, got a scholarship to college, et cetera. But I didn't think I was good. So after 30 days, I had some stars and I had some hope. And so I continued starting to make exercises for myself and uh, people started seeing my exercises. It's kind of one of the reasons my mentor said, you're going to be a better coach than me because I've been making up exercises. I just didn't know what I was doing, right? I was just trying to change my own life. So then people started um, asking me what I was doing and how I was changing my life. And so combination with working at the mentor at the same time and him saying those things to me and then having that magical, mystical spiritual experience, those things all joined together to have me say, yes, I am meant to do, I meant to do, I meant to share what I know with others. And that was, I mean, me just saying it right now makes me go <gasps> like, <gasps> like the scariest thing in the whole world to even think that I knew anything that could help anybody was mind blowing. Was there ever a point, cause obviously you today seem, as you put it, <laughs> you seem to be doing well. Was there a point yep. during all of this process where it's like, hey, I've, I've you know, I think I've crossed, oh, yeah. I've, cr I've crossed the chasm. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Well, there's, you know, as you know, because you two are both, you know, uh, obviously who you are, you know that there's many chasms, right? Like there's different chasms to cross. But when I said yes to becoming a coach and surrendering to that, um, I think that was the biggest chasm of all because just being willing, willing to believe that I had something to contribute and that I had a right to contribute it, that was, it was impossible. Like, again, I could act like Morgana and I were saying earlier, I could act and pretend I was somebody else, but that I, Rhonda Britton, I mean, I remember teaching my first workshop in my house and I was maybe, you know, like 20, 30 pounds overweight at the time. And I was living in a house that had like broken tiles in the kitchen because we just bought it and it was like 1950s and it was old and you know had a bunch of stuff needed to be fixed and I remember thinking to myself I can't have people in this house because they're gonna look at me and they're gonna oh they're not gonna want to be around me and then look at that you know stuff on the tile right so the first I would say specifically the first five years it was a continuous you know continuous you know wake up wake wake awakening right and then writing the book, uh, my first book, Fearless Living in the year 2000, and then pub getting published by Random, uh, it was Random, uh, excuse me, Penguin Putnam back then, but now it's Penguin, Penguin Random House, um, was, you know, it was like a stake in the ground, right? It was like no going back, right? There's no going back when you write a book. You know, you, you're, 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 you're out there now. And I remember so distinctly, um, my assistant bringing in the book from the publisher, you know, they send it to you six weeks in advance, right? So they're sending me my little, you know, I got, she goes, I think it's your book. And I said, open it. She goes, I'm not opening it. I go, I'm not opening it, right? And I remember she made me open it, darn her. And I remember seeing the hardcover of Fearless Living and throwing it on the ground and being like, what have I done? I have to buy all 20,000 copies back because this is the most worst thing. What have I done? Like, people are going to know everything about me and they're going to know like where I've come from and um, it was horrifying. So, you know, just embracing that every, you know, it's like, I started out as a one-on-one -on -one coach. I never thought I would write a book. I was a one-on-one -on coach. I never thought I'd do workshop. I was a one-on -on coach. I never thought I'd be on TV. I was a one-on -on coach. I never thought I'd have a radio show. Like you just have to follow the, you know, the, 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 you know, the breadcrumbs. Right. Um, and so where you start is not where you end. And I had to, those chasms were every time I surrendered to the next incarnation of, how I was supposed to share my work and how I grew as a coach and a human being and what to share and how to share it. So you, know, you, you said something really interesting a minute ago and what it brought up for me was that there was a point for my own book um, before, before it came out, I got a call from the publisher and I never got a call from the publisher. Publishers don't do that. 
they're to be they're to be hated at some later point in time. You, most people do hate their publishers. That's correct. Right. So, <laughs> so he called me and he was like, literally, "Hey, man, the train is leaving the station." Oh, oh god! <gasps> oh. Right, the train is leaving the station, and I was kind of like, "Well, what do you mean?" He's like, "Well." you don't know the reach your book will eventually have. You don't know who it's going to affect, who's gonna read it, what they're going to, what and how they're going to respond to it. And did you ever have that moment? I mean, obviously you're gasping. And now that, now that once they're sending you the hard copy, it's like, it's too late. It's too late. Right, but was there a moment that you kind of went through where it was like, for me, there really was. By that time I received the call from the publisher, I was like, all right, well, the train is leaving the station. And, you know, I remember, I remember going to my mother's house and sitting her down. And I said, hey, listen, I wrote this book about dad uh, and I wrote this book and I'm in the book and you're in the book and everybody in the book looks terrible. And that's, that's where we're at. And <laughs> And there's, and you know, for me, there was like this kind of shrug and, and whatever. I'm not yeah. going to bore you with the details. But what did that. she ask? Oh, she said, she goes, is it funny? She goes, because if it's not funny, then it's, you know, this is terrible. But if it's funny, so, you know, but again, getting back to you in terms of your own experience, uh, was there a, a moment like in the own, like whether it was before publication or after publication where it was like, hey, you read it and it's like, okay, this is me and I'm good. Well, as it's one of the chasms. Yeah, well, it, it's interesting that you say that because I also brought the book and gave it to my sisters because remember, this is an event that happened to all three of us, even though they didn't witness it, it was their father and mother too, right? So one of the things I did before I gave the final version to the publisher was ask my sisters to read it and could they stand by it? Because the last thing I wanted was my sisters to go, well, that's not what happened, you know? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it actually is the only time, think about this. It is the only time my sisters and I have talked about my parents' death. Whoa. The only time was when I had them read the chapter because we were all together for somebody's birthday. And so all three of us were in the same room. They just read it. They all came back to the kitchen and we're talking about it. And I asked them, are you okay? Any changes? What do you think? And both of them said, um, Shockingly, to be honest, uh, this is your experience and we're okay with it. You know, I'm okay with it. And then my other sister said, I'm okay with it. And, you know, this is what you went through. And that was huge. That was huge. Um, and the writing process, and I don't know if you went through this, but, you know, at the very end, when you're writing all the final edits, you know, the, the red line, all the edits, right? Um, I would one version, like one, you know, like one time I'm reading it, I'm like, this is the greatest book in the history of the world, right? And then the next time I'd read it, I'd be like, this is the worst book in the history of the world. So I went through that, like one minute hating it, one minute loving it, one minute hating it, one minute loving it. And um, I'd already been speaking and already been on Oprah by this time. So I'd already had some of those moments. So um, when I got that hard copy, I think is when the like, holy crap. And then they sent me on book tour. So I, um, you know, I'm in 35 cities across the country, go to England, Scotland, Ireland, Australia, all over the world for my book. And that was like, holy crap. People wanted to hear what I had to say. And they came to a book reading with me, you know, just all those moments just, all of those moments is taking him in and going, yes, Rhonda, yes, yes, Rhonda, yes, you know, and um, so, yeah, I think that getting that hardcover was huge in the mail was one of my ooh, chasms. Mm -hmm. So let's shift to another book <clears throat> and another topic, Fearless Loving. What brought that around? Well, um, Fearless Loving was, um, I knew that I wanted to write that next. So Fearless, so I, I got a, a book deal uh, with Penguin and then immediately upon, I don't even know if, it, I think it must have published it. Maybe I did, maybe, I can't remember if they offered me a second book deal right away or what, but then we got the second deal and I knew I wanted to write about love. Um, but as I'm sure you're experiencing, Devin, the second book, you know how they say like the second album, the second book, it's like, yay this was great this was a winner yay right and now it's like oh crap can i can i do it again like what the heck 
So Fearless Loving was actually, I don't want to say it was harder to write because it wasn't necessarily harder to write, but it was almost on some level scarier to write because I'd already had success with Fearless Living. And it becomes that expectation, right? And so, so Fearless Loving uh, was definitely the next book I wanted to write because I wanted to talk about love because it's fear or love, right? There's the only two emotions when you get down to it is fear and love. So Fearless Living is all about breaking down how fear works. And of course we talk about love in there, but I needed one and wanted one devoted to the act and art of love because that is really truly when you get down to it, the solution to fear. Everything, every, you know, people think I coach money. Money is just a stand in for like a mirror of whether we feel loved by the universe, whether we feel worthy, whether we feel good enough. Mm. And these are all love issues. It's money is just like a, a kind of painful measuring stick for our yes. feelings of being loved. Yes. That's beautiful. So, um, so how does fearless loving relate to romance? Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. Well, the first word that comes to my mind is vulnerability, right? Mm. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm preaching to, I'm talking to the choir now. It's like, in order to experience love, you must be vulnerable. And so when I gave my book tour and spoke all over, all over with Fearless Loving, I would say things like, are you willing to love yourself more than be loved by another? Are you willing to cherish yourself more than be cherished by another? Are you willing to be devoted to yourself more than be devoted by, to another, right? By, by another. And so many people think that being loved by somebody else will make them feel love inside. And of course, you know, we all know here that that's actually not the recipe for success, right? So, you know, when I would say things like, are you willing to cherish yourself more than be cherished by somebody else? It would blow their mind. Like they couldn't even comprehend that they would cherish themselves that much. And, you know, one of the things that I know is that our willingness to be vulnerable uh, takes great courage, right? And so we must practice facing our fear and being okay with our fear and, and loving ourselves through our fear in order to actually experience the love that is our destiny, the love of ourselves, the love of others, uh, love uh, from our students, our fans, our friends, our, our coworkers, et cetera, they, from the universe, from source. I had the weirdest experience with Devin about six months into the relationship and it's going really, really well. And I've never been in such a great relationship with such a loving guy. And it was like these big bubbles of self-loathing started to rise up out of nowhere that I didn't know that I had. Yes, yes. It's a wonderful cleansing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it, it's so beautiful that you say that because I think that's, it's almost like that's what we, like, we have to say that, right? We have to say like, oh, by the way, when you feel really loved for the first time, <laughs> all your shit's going to hit the fan, right? <laughs> like all of it's coming up to be healed. All of it's coming out to get released. All of it's coming up for you to look at and go, I love you too, so that you can really truly receive love from another. So I, I love that you said that because that experience is so precious and, and so divine and so, mm, so rich, right? Yeah. I, I think what, I think what you're both describing, I, 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 I completely agree. And I kind of look at it in a slightly different way is that, you know, what you were describing, by the way, was totally me it was like, this is the greatest. I'm a genius. I'm writing. I'm writing at 3.30 in the morning. I'm the genius. This is the most incredible book. People will be rolling out rugs for me and giving me yep. tapes and, it, you know, all of that stuff. Or I'm reading the same paragraph an hour and a half later going, Oh, this is this is I'm tragic. A crap. <laughs> I'm 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 the worst human being, and this is humiliating, and everyone's going to know this deep seated. You know, it's a, a true embarrassment. And so, I think really a lot of it is like whether I am 
up here or down here, they're both sort of the same sort of reaction. Like it's almost like coming from nothing in particular. Yeah. And for me, a lot of it comes to comes down to, I have to start being conscious about where my feeling is at any one point or another. In other words, I have to kind of go, whether I'm up here, because being up here is great, it's euphoric, but it's a little nonsensical most of the time. And when I'm down here, I have to do the similar kind of thing, which is like, wait, wait, what does this even mean? Yes. And more often than not, it's like, it's that stabilizing, oh, right, really what it is, is I'm actually a pretty great guy, but I'm not the greatest guy in the history of North America either. <laughs> Maybe I could take a deep cleansing breath, have a snow cone, and go call somebody I love and tell them I love them and sort of kind of regroup. So I yeah. think part of it for me has to do with sort of like my reactive nature versus my conscious nature. Because yes. those two other things are the things that just show up out of the blue. And those yeah. are... Well, you, this is actually a wonderful segue, my love. Oh, good. Um, I can participate. You have a chapter called Feelings Lie. I love that, that concept. Can you talk about that? What do you mean by feelings lie? Yeah, I think the I think our society, especially in the personal development uh, world, self help world, spiritual world, we're all caught up in the feeling, right? We're caught up the you hear feeling tone, you know, you hear um, feelings. Pay attention to your feelings, you know, it's your feelings guide you, right? But when you're driven by fear, you also have feelings, right? And those feelings, I was just talking to clients today. I had three client sessions today, and all three of them, literally, this is our conversation today, is you know, they feel like they don't know which feeling to believe, right? They don't like, like they've been taught like, oh, if I'm sad, it must mean I'm sad. It must mean that I must do something then now that because I'm sad, right? Or I'm angry. I, I'm a horrible person because I'm angry, right? So they have a feeling and they actually believe that feeling is who they are. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, like Devin said just a minute ago, it's just, it's just a feeling that's moving through you. Just like we're taught about in meditation about thoughts moving through you, feelings move through you. So a lot of times when people have a thought and then they have the feeling, that feeling is a lot, it li it's lying about that thought. It's lying about that belief. It's lying about the situation. It's lying about it. So you're not actually seeing with clarity. And then you take the thought and you take that feeling and you go and you run with it, right? Especially when you're, especially it's, it's really confusing when you're first starting on this journey or when you're in a place in this journey where you're really trying to go over that chasm, as Devin said, you know, like just really jump over or, or, you know, go down it and crawl back up. But when you're doing that, it's like, it gets very confusing. What's the truth and what's a lie. And a lot of people think their thoughts are the bad things and their feelings are the true things. And that's not actually true when it, when I always say that every feeling can be uh, driven by fear or freedom, right? Every feeling, even love, Right. So people say, well, it's fear or love. And I go, yes, as we talked about earlier, of course, it's fear and love. Yet most people's love is actually driven by fear. So the feelings they have about love or how they view love or how they see love, et cetera, is actually fear driven. And therefore, those feelings attached to those feelings, feelings uh, to fear, uh, to, to love are actually not necessarily the ones you want to follow. So. You know, every I believe every feeling, every belief, you know, everything is, you know, every value can be served to by fear or freedom. So I want people to even know what love, how love can be used in service to fear, which is we know people pleasing. You know, I, I thought I was very loving. I thought I was the most amazing girlfriend in the whole world, you know, when I was an alcoholic. You know, I thought I was amazing. I thought I was so loving. But what I didn't, I didn't put boundaries up. I didn't know how to say no. Um, I, you know, didn't know, uh, what to say yes to, um, I sacrificed myself because I grew up with sa sacrifices love. So I think a lot of people, you know, think love and people pleasing equal each other, love and sacrifice equal each other, you know, love and giving of yourself equal each other. Now, again, all of those aspects are, as we know, there's healthy aspects to that, but most of us and most of the people that come to me, and I'm sure you've experienced this as well, the two of you is that they've got it all confused. So when people feel so certain of a particular feeling, we have to put it through a different filter in order to give them a, a clear perception of where that feeling is being driven from. 
And do they want to act on that feeling? Do they want to enhance that feeling? Do they want to, you know, kind of uh, stoke that feeling? Or does that feeling, is that just feeling giving them information about what they're going through, what they're scared of, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I, I mean, people who talk about like, follow the feelings, and I'm like, no, um, don't do, it. in the beginning. But again, once you get clear, yeah, feelings are awesome and follow it, sure, absolutely. But for most people, most of the time, your feelings are not a great barometer. What are, by the way, oh, there's something you said that just made me think that you can't, especially the, the thing that you said about not saying no, because I, you know, we, we grew up in our own chaotic households. It's like miraculous that we have a healthy relationship. But the ability to say no when you grow up without boundaries can feel crushing and it can also feel terrifying. Yes. Devastating. Yeah. But you can't say yes if you can't say no. That's not, that's not a yes. That's right. As, as I say, I think one of, the, one of my chapters in um, Fearless Loving is your yes means nothing if you can't say no. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So, right. <laughs> so, yeah, but we're on the same track, right? Like your yes means nothing. Like people think their yes is like, look, I'm giving you my yes. It isn't this precious. Like, no, if you can't say yes and no to the same thing, your yes means nothing. Mm -hmm. You're not truly giving a yes. You're giving a yes out of I have to, or else they won't like me. I, I have to, or I'm not going to be a good person. I have to. So that's not an actual yes, right? Yeah, no, there's this, there's this idea. The, the, the way I've always looked at it is that it's very easy to kind of talk about love in terms of that, that yes, just jump in with both feet. Part of it has to do, for me anyway, is sort of like the motivation of why I'm shooting for the yes. And sometimes I've said, I love you, not because I want somebody to hear it, but really I'm hoping they're going to say it back to me. That's right, that's right. So I'm then validated by it. That's and right. a, another example that I've, I've talked about many times is that you know there was a point where I'd be pushing my daughter when she was tiny in the supermarket down the cookie aisle, and she would see the clowns with the, you know, with the raspberry sprinkles on them, and she'd go crazy. Right. And as the father, I'm already running through my head of all the moments of her being hopped up on sugar that I'm going to be displeased by it. However, at some point, not always, but some points I would cave and I would hand her the cookies with sort of like, oh, I love you. And really what I'm feeling and I am even thinking I might be thinking I might even be feeling love, but really when we get to the motivation of why those things were taking place, it's because I just wanted her to shut up. That's right. That's and right. And that that's not that's not love. That's the fear. Yes. That's the part where it's sort of like the negotiation rather than what love is supposed to be about. Yeah. The rationalization of, oh, I don't have to look at myself too closely because aren't I doing a loving thing? And you know, I grew up in a family and uh, an environment of self-sacrifice. So, and, and we didn't have feelings, like there were no feelings, you didn't feel. And you, and I mean, I never remember a conversation with my parents ever besides like, what are we having for dinner? Like our family didn't talk about things. We didn't have family discussions. You didn't feel anything. Um, you weren't, I wasn't allowed to be proud of myself if I, you know, got an A because I don't want to make my sisters feel bad. You know, it was always about um, you know, making everybody else okay. And, and you have to sacrifice in order to be of service to everybody else. And again, I have no problem with the service mentality. I love service. Yet, if you're not actually showing up, as you're saying, you know, as a willing and a yes participant, then you're not really showing up as a yes, right? Your motivation is, again, like you're saying, Devin, about, I don't want to hurt anybody rather than I want to actually stand and say yes. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a fascinating concept to really wrestle with because I think what's happened is, and this is, and I think this comes across in almost anything, anything that we do, any community that we're a part of, any religion that we may believe in has some component to it where there's sort of like an abject good. And if we do the abject good, then there's just the rewards. So what ends up happening is while the goodness may or may not exist, we line ourselves up with this thing in an almost sort of like, I have to do this because it's good. Yes. Or I have to do this to avoid the bad. 
Yes, yes. And it's a very it's a very tricky thing because what ends up happening is we as sort of like we want to promote ourselves as good or we want to align ourselves with good yeah. or these ideas, whether we understand them or not, or whether we've stopped to go, geez, am I actually helping a circumstance or am I actually being a detriment in this mindset of, of my goodness or of my yeah. love? And that goodness, um, you know, you're not, as we all know here, it's, you know, I was talking to one client today and she goes, you know, so I said, what did you get from this session? You know, and she goes, um, I don't include myself in my own life. And I said, yeah, mm -hmm. you don't include yourself in your own life. So all these people with the concepts of good, as you're saying, Devin, you know, aren't even in, even, even self-reflection of actually even including themselves in the decision. There's, there is no self-reflection, right? There is no, huh, is this good for me? Huh, does this work for me? Huh, is this what I want to do? Huh, there is no conversation. It's just that concept is idolized. I know that's how I grew up. That concept is idolized and therefore you have to live the concept. The right. challenge is, is that when that concept is too tight around your neck and you're suffocating. Right. Absolutely. We're getting close to the end. So I want to drop a ginormous topic in your lap. Um, and it relates to the note because I find from you know, my own experience, when I am not okay saying no, I'm also not okay with other people saying no, because like, I assume we're on the same rule book of you're not allowed to say no. And that comes to the notion of rejection. Mm. And I think that's the biggest conscious fear that anybody has in love. So mm. I know you address that. I do. I, 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 I always say that rejection can be your superpower, right? Because rejection is, it's just, you know, of course, it's exactly what we're talking about. Rejection is I'm putting your opinion of me before my own, right? Mm. Your opinion of me matters more. And therefore, if you say no, that is a reflection of me, that must mean I'm wrong or I'm bad. Right. So the other thing about rejection is we're also, when we have that fear of rejection, we're, we're also not knowing where we end and the other person begins. You know, one of the things I always tell my shout terror with my clients is I want you to create a space between you and another human being. And there is a space between you two. And I want you to know where you end and the other person begins. And when, um, when that fear of rejection comes up, it doesn't feel that way. We just take it all on, right? We just, it's me. I'm, I'm wrong. I'm at fault. This, it must be me. They're rejecting me instead of like, mm, no, they just said no, that, you know, we have to make up a meaning to make life make sense. We make up meanings, we make up stories. Right. And so when we get rejected, we make up stories and meanings. And again, most people blame themselves, you know, especially if you're conscious and awake and want to be a good person, you're totally going to blame yourself. And it, it blaming yourself in that moment is a, a form of self-control, because if I can blame myself, if you reject me and I can blame myself, then I can do something about it and I can become better and I can do it different and then I won't get rejected next time. But as you and I know, um, rejection is the sweetness of life. It's the bitterness, bittersweet of not life. And without rejection, we don't know where our edge is. Without, our, without rejection, we don't know how to take risk. Without rejection, we don't know where we end and another begins. Without rejection and that willingness to take that risk, we don't actually know where we stand. So, you know, rejection is, is a practice, you know, by taking risks, taking a risk. Obviously, there's going to be a, a taste of rejection in there. The risk has to, the, the action of the risk has to be more valuable than the fear of the rejection, right? And where you end and another begin. So I think rejection it stops so many people from uh, dating, from saying yes to love, uh, yes to you know forming a home together, to form a family, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, usually that rejection just comes from a, again, we all know false belief in thinking that there is something wrong that they have to hide. So again, going back to the very first topic we talked about, which is vulnerability, you know, vulnerability cures fear of rejection, because if you're willing to be vulnerable and be honest and have yourself and give yourself compassion, uh, doesn't mean rejection won't hurt, but rejection won't have the same bitterness. It'll just have the bittersweetness, right? It'll be a bummer, but it's like, okay, got it. You'll be able to surrender to it and move on. So 
So with that said, you to, to go loop back to our beginning where we're giving out gold stars, right, for our, our uh, the things that we did that are good, um, what might you suggest to somebody who is, in fact, paralyzed by some notion of rejection? I can't, I can't go online because it's terrifying, or what if nobody likes me, or you, you get the whole picture. Is there something that you might suggest for a piece of advice for somebody who's struggling with this? Yeah, I have a couple things. The first thing that comes through is a version of my star exercise. And it's called in the world of fearless living, it's called acknowledgements. And it's today I acknowledge myself for because if you blame yourself, i.e. in rejection, you think it's your fault, rejection, uh, doing acknowledgements will be very difficult because acknowledgements are actually giving yourself credit for any movement forward, any new insight, any new aha, any movement, any tiny, like little tiny willingness. You know, you complain 100 times yesterday and complain 99 today, you acknowledge yourself, right? But people who are afraid of rejection, the people that, you know, as we're describing, they go all or nothing. Like I'm a bad person, or I'm a good person, right? I'm perfect or I'm flawed, right? We get into that black and white thinking. I'm the greatest writer. I'm the, the greatest world. writer or, or I'm uh, the worst, right? Please <laughs> the gray. Right, right. And, and right, gray. I mean, on the show starting over, I had a client and I actually kept the um, image that we wrote and uh I had her write the word uh, gray, right? I had her write the word gray. And then she put black and white and we did this whole painting. And I said, see how the black and white, you know, just basically uh, screw you up and living in the gray. And most people are afraid of the gray, but gray is where life sweetness is. Light gray is where life happens. Gray is where you have choice. Gray where is your personal power. Gray is the name. So yes, I love gray. So acknowledging yourself today, acknowledge myself for any movement forward, no matter how small, start separating yourself from your all or nothing thinking, starts building your self-confidence up because like, oh, I can do that even if it's just for five seconds, right? Just starting to build that. Another exercise is actually just starting to physically start noticing where you end and the other person begins, mm -hmm. like literally doing that. I ask my clients to put their, their hand, you know, put their hand on your shoulder when you're next to somebody, just as a reminder of like, you stop here, you stop here. This is where you stop, stop right here. Yes. <laughs> Morgan has really thing. embodied this exercise. <laughs> I have my hand like about three quarters across of Devin's body. Right. So we're about to wrap up. I know you have, for people who want to get to know you better and stay in relationship, you have a free gift and we, and you'll send me the link and we'll post it on the show, but do you want to describe it briefly in like sure, 30 well, seconds? Actually, it actually goes along with this actual acknowledgement exercise. Mm -hmm. um, it's called stretch risk or die. Mm. And basically I am going to shift what you think risk is. And I'm going to shift, it basically cures procrastination. And it basically shows you what actually is truly stopping you um, and how to move past it. So it's a really quick, it's 45 minutes, three 15 minute videos. Um, and please go and get it. It's got worksheets, it's got love worksheets, it's got mm. finance worksheets. And you're gonna start seeing how, oh, that's why I do that. Oh, that's why I do. Okay. And you're going to start being able to uh, quickly, and in fact, build your self-esteem. And what we've a, got about 10 seconds you, left. What a great way to start the year period with that frame of stretch, risk, or die. I think that's a, that's a really powerful way to start 2021. So this is, I think, the end of our show, Crazy Sexy Midlife Love. We are here every Wednesday at 5 p.m., Thank you so much, Rhonda. You were spectacular and I love you. And we'll see each other in person as soon as this pandemic is over. Uh, tune in next week, Wednesday, 5 p.m. Pacific. Mwah. Thank you for listening to Crazy Sexy Midlife Love. Please sign up to join our free love family at CrazySexyMidlifeLove.com to get alerts to live shows, call in and ask questions, or just listen in. And ladies, don't forget to download Devin's free ebook, Women Are Smarter Than Men and Other Secrets Marriage-Minded Women Need to Know. Also available at crazysexymidlifelove.com